Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to uh, another virtual coffee with me. Uh, my name is Francois. Thank you very much for joining me. I deeply appreciate it. This is episode 49. 49 in 49 days. We are here, one away from hitting the big 50. I don't think I've even in cricket ever made a 50. So <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, really, really awesome. I have a fantastic guest this morning. Uh, Louis van der Merwe is with us this morning, and he's going to share a lot about what they're doing in their business, how they're doing it. We're going to talk about a whole host of things. We will talk about his journey. We are going to talk about mentors. We will talk about, you know, what if he had to restart his business today or he had to start a financial planning business today, even during this time, what would he have done? Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, charging for advice. They, they are fee-based, so they charge for that. And we'll talk about what worked and what didn't work. And also, you know, in technology. I know Louis is a big technology buff and he loves technology. And I'll, I'll, I really want to chat to him about what is or what are they doing in their business and how are they really using technology to, to do that. And then there's a couple of other things uh, that I want to talk about with Louis as well. So welcome to another show. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Yesterday, we had the business assurance refresher. It went very well. Time worked out perfectly, no glitches, no nothing. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you to all 35 people that were there. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you got a lot of value from that. Uh, and uh, yeah, the next one will be estate planning. So we're going to do an estate planning refresher, but I will announce that later on. So that will be a couple of weeks from now. It's not going to be very soon, uh, but we are planning that uh, already. All righty. So great stuff. Um, let me see if we are live on LinkedIn, if LinkedIn knows that we are live. Let me just have a look and see um, what is happening there. Uh, let me go over to, to LinkedIn. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to call out a couple of names. There's so many people saying hi. Thank you so much, uh, Quibbers and Terrence. Uh, you know, get, I'm glad to see you back, Terrence. It's been a while since you said good morning and you got coffee and a rusk. And uh, yeah, and thanks. Uh, we hit 350 subscribers yesterday. So uh, very grateful for that. Uh, thank you very much to everybody that has subscribed to the channel when we started this journey. Uh, I will give you some stats at some point. It was supposed to be for the 50th, and then we got Ross Bernstein tomorrow. So I'm not going to talk about anything else tomorrow than, than talking to him. And uh, But yeah, Slanganani and Johan Fosler, uh, Kasper, Conrad, Craig, Eberson, nice to have you back, Craig, Malcolm, Elmin, Denise, Chart, all the regulars, Tinas, Raymond, uh, Marilise, Gary, Gary Walker, uh, Ian McMaster, Raymond, um, good morning, Razan. You've said hello a couple of times, so welcome, 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 all three times. Uh, Neil, Kevin, and Bongi, thank you very much for being here. I deeply appreciate it, and uh, let me just see if I can see anything over here on my friends on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not, you see, today I'm not getting a notification of my own show over on LinkedIn, so that's cool. Um, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Um, it's fine. Let me just see. All right. All righty. So, uh, thank you very much. As I said, uh, I really appreciate you being here. Um, please interact chat, uh, ask Louis questions. You can send the questions in the chat. I will definitely ask Louis, uh, or, or relay those questions to him to answer at the end. So we're not going to do it as we go through. I just want to get through what it is we want to talk about, and then we'll, we'll field all of the questions at the end. Uh, and, and make it, uh, you know, really valuable from that point of view. And then please give us some love, share us, like us, you know, do all that good stuff. And and uh, please sub sub subscribe to, to the channel on YouTube and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that. We really appreciate your support. Then just lastly, I've really gotten almost 40 responses now uh, for the poll. Uh, if you can please go and just complete this poll. I did send it out on WhatsApp yesterday as well. Uh, but if you missed it or you're not on my WhatsApp list, uh, then please, uh, if you can go to francho.toy.co.za, VCF poll. I see it's taking people on average six and a half minutes to complete. It's mostly ticking. Uh, we've gotten fantastic, fantastic feedback so far. It's really helping me a lot to determine where we want to go with the show uh, going forward. And uh, that's really important that, that we do the things that will be valuable to you. And that will also work from a practical and, uh, and a logistical point of view. Uh, for that. So thank you very much. If you can please, uh, as I said, I'll leave it on there for a while so that you can do it. You can do it on your phone or your laptop. Uh, really easy. It's mostly ticking. You don't have to type if you don't want to. Um, it's just where we are asking for, you know, give us some, if you want to give us some additional feedback. And for everybody that said all those nice things, thank you very, very much. I'll share the, obviously the results in a future show as well. And we were also the people that asked to be 
to be informed. You'll get it first. We'll send it to you via email uh, and uh, so that you can see what the results are and what other people are saying collectively. So and some interesting stats that we've already determined from this. Uh, so so really, really awesome. So yeah, let me see. Um, good morning, uh, Arun, Stephen, Al, Sasha Lee, Russell. Sasha Lee, it's the first time I think I've seen you here. Welcome, a special welcome to you. And Marky, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate you being here. You say you've done the feedback. Thank you very much uh, for that. I appreciate it. Then um, yesterday we had the SME show, uh, which is a completely different show from this. Uh, but there we spoke about, uh, we had three guests on, three business owners telling their story of, you know, two of them have started their business last year, went very well in the first few months. And then all of this hit. One is in tourism, one is in interior design. And, and construction and then another uh, the third business is in uh, what do you call it in uh, business or in building supplies and how all of them have, st have pivoted their, their business or they've really adapted their business they started doing new things and what they're focusing on and where they are seeing opportunities so really uh, inspirational I speak to each of them for 15 minutes so you can check that out that's also on the YouTube channel uh, under small business there's a playlist for small business and you'll find it there in session four of the SME show. All right, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to my guest. Uh, he's a, uh, he was formerly in the top three, and I think he was runner up for the financial planner of the year at the FBI. Uh, was it last year? I think, Louis, I'm not 100% sure, but you can, you can tell us your story. I'm not 100% sure. But I met with Louis last year in September. Actually, uh, when he was up in Joburg, we had a chat and actually wanted to get him on the podcast and you know how it goes and then I'm busy and I don't get to invite him. And then with the show, I thought like, it's time I need to get Louis. Well, how much better to have him on our screens and have him talk to us live uh, than do it on a on a show or on a podcast that's recorded and you can't see the guy. So um, yes, I'm very very happy to welcome uh, Louis to the show. Louis, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Francois, and congrats on getting to almost fifty. Uh, it's really great what you've created. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Louis. We had a nice chat before the time as well. And I can see this is going to be a jam-packed show. Uh, we love talking and we've got <laughs> we've got lots of things in common. And I think the, the way that we view things is, is very much similar. Uh, but you've done some amazing things, Louis, and, and, and I really want to get into, into the detail. Um, and for me, the starting point would be just to share with us your, your journey. You know, um, what is Louis' story? Uh, you know, how did you get started in this industry and, and what's happened? And, you know, what's the journey been? Great. Thanks. Thanks for that question. I think where I would start is almost going back to university. So I was very fortunate to be able to study at the University of Stellenbosch and picking a undergraduate degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. There was some pieces from marketing that seemed interesting, um, some pieces from business. And in my second year, Professor Neil Kricher came to speak to us. And they started this new thing called a financial planning course, which was going to be focusing um, essentially on financial planning. So we'd have tax and have investment, you'd have all these financial planning related um, skills that you, can, that you can build up and knowledge that you can learn. And so I started to pursue that. And in my final year, I had to decide, okay, am I going to do my honors or am I going to go and work? And, and the opportunity came up to join um, a financial services provider that sat inside of an auditing firm. And that felt like it would, it would make sense, right? So it was a bigger, kind of more attractive business. And I then joined them, started doing my postgraduate diploma in financial planning to be able to write the CFP board exam and just go through the, go through the steps. And when I started, there was very fortunate to have two mentors, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, um, within the business. And around about the fourth year, myself and, and one of my colleagues I had a discussion around what financial planning would look in the future. And it was the time when uh, robo technology was uh, all the buzz in, in America and, and across the globe. And we thought that this is really something that we want to pursue. Um, long story short, we created some sort of robo advisor, tested it, um, and then decided to kind of break away and start my own financial services provider with my, with my colleague. Um, and that was seven and a half years. And it's been a great journey in the last seven and a half years just to be able to actually build a business. Um, wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Louis, and, and I mean, where are you? If you think that that's where you started, 
Um, you know, what were some of the, the the biggest challenges maybe on your road and where are you finding yourself at the moment? I guess it's very similar to most new businesses, right? So generating an income. Um, we positioned the business so that right from day one, we had everything in place so that we can earn money from day one. And that was quite different. But also it was a time in my life where I didn't really have any expenses. Worst case scenario would be I moved back uh, to my parents um, if things didn't really, really work out. Um, and a lot of business mentors always say that the best time to start something is they, wish, they just wish they would have started earlier. Um, and that was top of mind, just kind of jumping in. Um, I wouldn't say it was the easiest of routes, but I was also very fortunate that things fell into place over time. A lot of new opportunities came about. And at the moment, we are six people in the business. We've got a great team. We've got great clients. Um, our business is very much on an annuity basis. So more than 90% of our income comes from that annuity stream. But it takes a long time and it takes a lot of patience to, uh, to build that. Yes, and uh, I'm just now, one of the things I want to ask you is that, I, I mean, I'm not even sure how old you are and it doesn't really matter, but I mean, when you started, you were obviously, you were not married yet. Uh, you had the opportunity to move back to your parents if you had to. So, I mean, that means that you were very young in, in relation to, to many, like if you look at the average age of advisors in, in, in the business or in the industry or the profession, you know, you were a lot younger than them. Can, I mean, how did you get started? Because I think that is, it's a very hard thing for young advisors at the moment is how do I get started? Where, what, you know, what did you focus on? What is it, what was that thing you think that made you just get over that hump to see, well, this will work. Let's now, and we can go to the next level and the next level after that. That's, that's a great question. Something that comes up a lot. Um, so I'm turning 33 tomorrow. And I think one hack was just to grow a beard. And that's, uh, that's already helped a little, a little bit. Well, I did um, that at 45 for the first time. So well done. <laughs> so thinking back, I remember in my interview when joining the, the FSP, um, they asked me, like, you, you're very young, starting out. How would you differentiate yourself? Or how would you get past that barrier of clients saying, well, actually, I'm retiring. I've got all this money. What do you know? You've never been in this position. And at that stage, my answer was, well, I've built up my technical skills. I think that I, I'm, I'm strong in that. And I, I now realize that was almost maybe a bit of a crutch where if you get in front of those clients and the clients can see that you're taking them on this journey and you've got their best interest, age has never come up in the conversation. Um, definitely in the back of their minds, they must be thinking, oh, well, what is this guy going to do and is he still going to be around? And I think that's where it's important to have that structure around and, and almost create safety for your clients to say that this is how we operate. I mean, I've been very fortunate that most of my uh, consultations were in a team environment, right? So we would have a senior advisor and a junior advisor. And over time, you'd build up the confidence. Um, the other key part was that from the beginning, I was salary-based. And it is very much a luxury that I know that most advisors don't have. Um, so we strongly believe that that is the way of the future to employ younger financial planners, pay them a salary for as long as possible. And, and in my mind, forever, um, but also share in, in the fruits of their, of their labor. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. Um, and then I want to ask you one more question about your, your business and where you are at the moment. I mean, are you fee-based or have you built the business on assets under management? Is the robo-advisor still going? You know, what is the situation currently with, with your practice um, in, in terms of, of the business model, if you will? Okay. So it's a, it's a bit of a mix. Um, we have a very small component of our business that is, that is commissioned from the life insurance products. That's, uh, that's so small. The bulk of our income is still coming from assets under management, right? So making sure that we look after clients' money. And I guess the, the dilemma with that is that if you're being paid on investments, clients measure you in terms of the investment experience or the investment outcomes. And we've realized that actually investment planning and financial planning has to sit together. And we were giving away financial planning just so that we can charge on the assets. And in the last couple of years, we've tried exploring ways to just put the value of financial planning in front of, in front of clients. Um, we had a couple of clients say, 
you manage my money, but who can I talk to for financial planning? Um, and I guess the light went on saying, uh, okay, maybe we miscommunicated or we didn't explain the value of financial planning. Um, do you want me to touch on the kind of specific details of how we charge? I think we'll get to that a little bit later because I've got it on the list. I do want to talk about it. Um, but just as long as we know, like sort of, you know, what the structure of the business is and that you rely on on multiple sources of income still and that you've actually built it uh, around that way. So so that's great. Um, then you spoke about mentors, Louis. So I want to ask you the question about um, it seems like mentors have played a very important role in your life and that it's something that you deeply believe in. Um, you know, what has your experience been with this and and you know, did, why did you find it so valuable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if I had to look back now, I've always tried to identify people that have been through a similar experience that I would expect myself to go. Um, I guess starting out, my dad always ran or was still running his own business. So that idea of mentorship has been kind of strong in, in the family and, and the support that comes from that. And that's also why I. I don't think it was very intentional, but it just happened to, to be that way. Um, I had two really great financial planning mentors. I mean, one of them started the business together. And still today, we have very kind of constructive discussions and, and open feedback around that. Um, the other component is almost just looking at what people are doing globally that you would see as a mentor and just imagining what advice they would give you also really helps. So even if you don't have access to one of the bigger names, like a Ron Carson in America, just thinking of what kind of advice they would give is a valuable exercise. Um, and then also just taking that and kind of being that mentor for someone else, uh, just a, a feedback mechanism so that they can uh, reflect on their, on their process is really important. And do you think that, you know, can you get a mentor any time in your career? So if you are 55, and you feel like you don't know where the world's going, you don't know what's happening, is that still a good time to get a mentor or is it something that you need when you start out? Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at the top 10 tennis players in the world, how many of them have coaches? Well, 10 out of 10. So, and these are the people that are right at the top of their game. I think there's always something that we can, we can learn, right? So if you can look at any industry and you can say, well, what can this person teach me? And there's, there's definitely always something. Um, I think it's important to have that kind of beginner's mindset to say, well, can I take a little piece away from this and what can I learn from this? And I mean, you're a great example. Just the content that you share is always something. Um, and if you don't listen, you can really, you can easily miss it. Yeah, because <laughs> I talk so fast. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, you said something very important now to say the beginner's mindset. Um, you know, I, I always tell people like, when you're in a training session or you're in a in a show or a webinar or anything like that, you know, don't say, oh, I know this, oh, I know that, oh, it's old news, it's this, it's that, you know, and, uh, you know, but if you're open to, it's like, well, that's interesting. Oh, wow, how great that I know I'm reminded of this. It's a, it's just also a mindset thing. So, and this thing you're saying, like, have a beginner's mindset. If you, if you ever think that you know everything and that you've arrived, you know, that's really when you, when you're starting to, to, go down the road of, of, of taking on risk in your business uh, and, and your sustainability of your business, you know, just simply because you think you can't learn anything anymore. And, and I, I've learned things about people who's brand new in the industry because they are the ones that tend to ask great questions. You know, the longer you stay in this, the more you start thinking like others, the more you start doing like others, the more like this is the way we do it. And we is not only in my business anymore, we becomes the industry. This is how we operate. And I saw this last year, uh, when I was facilitating NK6 classes uh, on behalf of Mill Park at, uh, at, at one of the big insurers, they, they had a group of advisors that they sent there. And, and they were all, I mean, the nice thing about it is that they were all like, I don't know, I'm not going to say that I'm going to offend some of them, but uh, most of them were like definitely on the much older side, if I was saying like 55 plus. So it was great for me to see that they're there working on their knowledge, getting their NKF6 because they've been around for so long. But you can also see if I throw things to them that, they like, no, 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 but you don't know. This is how it works. Like you do this and this and this and this because one day, 50 years from now, my grandson is going to get a referral from that person for, and I understand that's how it works, but I don't think, you know, things are changing and things are evolving. 
Um, and, and when we get to the advice part about how you charge for that, there's one particular question that I want to want to ask you as, as well that I think we'll come back to that. Um, so sorry, so I'm just adding on to, to what you're saying in, in terms of that. Um, yeah, so so basically, I mean, you you should get a mentor whenever you feel like you need one. It doesn't matter if you've been in this game, if you're planning to retire in five years from your practice or whether you're just starting out or anywhere in between. You know, get a mentor. Uh, get somebody that you can share your ideas with and soundboard with and just get wisdom from. I think that's what it's about. It doesn't have to be a formal relationship. It doesn't have to be a mentor-mentee contract, right? It's just someone that's influencing you and helping you shape your own thoughts and your own voice. Yeah. And sometimes just by, for them listening, if you just say things, sometimes you hear yourself and what you are saying, instead of thinking about, you know, you actually hear yourself and then you answer yourself actually in that, in that moment, which I think is the most powerful uh, way to go about it. Louis, so let's, uh, so how long have you now been uh, in the industry and how long have you been like since, since you started? So this is my 11th year. 11th year okay so let's let's take your 11 years of knowledge your expertise your uh skills everything let's put it in the bucket and we delete everything that exists at the moment so let's just say you lose everything there's nothing more and louis had to restart today uh, and you had to build a new practice from scratch you've got no clients there's nothing to fall back on the only thing you've got is your skills your experience your knowledge how would you do it it's, I think that's a great question and it's a great thought exercise. And, and one thing I kind of always ask is if someone took away your FSP license tomorrow, would you still have a business? Would clients still be willing to come to you to pay for something? And with that intentionality, I think the experience that we can create for clients is probably that much more important than the actual financial products. And you've spoken about it a couple of times as well. So I think if I had to start from scratch again today, I would very much take the approach of just sharing more content and more knowledge. I think the fact that now almost, well, everyone is, is happy with virtual meetings. Everyone's consuming their content online uh, at a time where it's convenient for them. I think that would probably be my starting point. Um, we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of legacy issues because every now and again we scrap our systems and we say, okay, let's start again. And that's almost like going, starting from scratch one, but you have this base of clients that, that can support you. And that takes a really long time. Um, so I would hate to lose that. But I think the process of talking through it and saying what in your business is maybe there just because this is the way you've always done it, right? Challenge that and say, well, should we really be doing this? And with the lockdown, it shown us that there's a lot of things that we're probably just doing out of habit, right? Instead of doing it with intentionality. Yeah. And um, so is there something specific that you would focus on if you had to restart today? So like where you would start, if you think where you started back in when you first started, I mean, you were part, you were in that, accounting practice or audit practice and uh you know you had some mentors and people getting going you got a salary um you know but what would you what would you focus on first if you started today again i think building that um the the, the coaching skills so the value of financial planning lies in the technical side but also the relational side right so being able to guide a client through a process ask powerful questions so for me it would be building that coaching side spending less time on systems um i had to get to conclusions so well actually you just maybe be hiding hiding behind these systems um because it's got an impact on relationships so i guess putting relationships before everything else um and then just i would probably follow follow a very similar process um because it's worked and and i'm kind of i'm very happy where we are now but there's always something to work on so for me it would be focusing on the coaching things and spending less time on on systems and technology okay and would you and would you partner with somebody again like you did back well i would say partner like back in the day in, in terms of uh you, you joined that it was a fsp within an accounting practice so there was call it there was opportunity there or would you completely start off on your own because remember you don't have any clients now you need to start from scratch so would you mm -hmm. would you enter into a strategic relationship or join like an FSP and then break away? Or would you 
you know, what approach would you follow in terms of that? I think you can be very successful as a as an individual advisor, right? From a monetary perspective, but it can get extremely lonely. So I would say no. Um, I would still look for a mentor, someone that's been through the process, someone that's willing to share their knowledge, their experience, someone that can build up the energy and, and tackle something together because there's very strong power in that in that team. And this is just bigger than just yourself um, to definitely follow follow the same approach, because we see a lot of advisors saying that it's it's very lonely and it's scary out there um, and that's why it's so great that you're building this community just so that people can come together and, and talk about the difficulties yes and thanks for that um one thing i want to ask still which is what is the one thing you wish you knew when you started that you didn't that you only learned later what is that one thing that it would take so, no, that's, a, that, that's a surprise question <laughs> that it would take out of a long time. Uh, I, I think i expected it but um yeah it, it takes a really long time much i know people say it takes two years or three years to build up a client base i want to say it takes 10 years right seth godin says it takes 10 years to become an overnight success um, don't feel like i'm there but i'm de definitely kind of implementing the things and making the steps so yeah just uh, just acknowledging and being aware that you need to commit this is almost like mm -hmm. a, a lifetime commitment um, which yes. is great awesome Alrighty, so we touched on the fact that you do charge uh, for certain of the advice and you've started exploring two years ago about how you want to charge and and trying different things. And that's one of the things I want to commend you for. It's something I've spoken about a lot on the show is you've got to try stuff. Don't be afraid to try. It's okay to for it not to work. Uh, it's okay for to to see things and, you know, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe rather the, the mindset should be, I should have done it this way and not that way. You know, that's maybe a better way to go. But I'm keen to hear, like, you know, what has been working in terms of the fees that you have tried in the last two years? What, which of, you know, what what models or, or what approach is is working actually? Mm -hmm. I think there's no perfect model. Um, so every model will have its pros and cons for clients and and for advisors. The thing that we had to, or that I had to start with is just believing in the value of financial planning. Right. So if you take away all the products and you take away uh, any investment or any insurance side, like, is there value in the financial planning? Right. So getting that mindset uh, right. And once you have that, then you can say, well, OK, how do we measure the value of that financial planning? Is the best way to measure it monetary? Maybe it's the tax that you're saving and it's the fees that you're saving on the investments. Or how do you measure the emotional side of having a discussion with your partner about your life goals, right? Being on the same page, getting people to start communicating, getting people to sleep better at night because they're not worried about their money. If you're coming from that lens or, or viewing it through that lens, the value of financial planning is probably way more than most people can afford. So then you want to start and kind of find that balance between affordability and the impact that your financial advice has so we are still experimenting it with it one that works quite well is that if someone just wants an hour of your time they most times they're so willing to be paying for that hour of your time and you can provide them with an invoice it doesn't have to be a full financial planning process um, so that's worked well just for the kind of one hour or two hour consultations and we've seen that Returning customers just come back a year from now saying, oh, I just want to chat to you for an hour and here's my list of questions. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to involve you giving advice. It can just be some guidance. And then the other two components is almost saying, does this client need ongoing financial planning? Right? Because I think most clients almost just need to get their structures right. They don't need to be paying a financial advisor every month. Yes, there are some clients with complex structures, that want to have the luxury of phoning you whenever they want, want to have regular interactions. And those guys, I think the assets under management model works really well for. So the people in the middle saying that I need 10 hours of your time to create a financial plan, but then I'm okay for the next couple of years, they we charge a project fee. So it's a discounted hourly rate. And the, we give a, the clients a quote up front. We know exactly where our relationship ends. Um, sometimes it includes the implementation of the product, sometimes not. Sometimes the clients take the product and they go directly 
to the product providers. And I, and I think that's definitely going to increase so that your relationship with your client moves away from just a transaction of implementing a product and more to a kind of a transformational relationship so that they can uh, they can see where they are and where they're going and how to get there. Yeah, I think you're saying it's such a valuable or making such a valuable statement in the fact that, you know, it's like, uh, and we, we need to understand that when you build a business, it needs to be aligned to what the client wants, not what, or, or, and that, and there's also maybe a disconnect a little bit about between what they need and what they want. Um, but we've got to align our business with them. And obviously you can have this philosophy and this business model where you say, listen, if this is, if, if, if we don't align in terms of what is important to us, then obviously we don't want to work together. But we need to understand that this is going to happen more and more. And I've said this so many times because there's so much information available. People do a lot of research. There's a lot of tools available. But then they want somebody's stamp of approval that they're understanding the stuff correctly and that they're following the right strategy. And that's where the opportunity sits. And it's, it sounds to me like or it feels to me like that's what you're talking about, where they, they feel like they want to do their own thing. And you're quite cool for them to do their own thing. It's not that they have to enter into a long-term relationship with you. Um, and they can just come to you for advice for the for the the stamp and saying, you know what, yes, we're doing the right thing, or we we're thinking about this correctly, or you know, highlight some risk for them. And there's a lot of value in it for them, and they'll be willing to pay whatever the fee is for that. Um, is that sort of where this is coming from, or is this how it's yeah, aligned? Spot on. I think there's there's two things. The number one is realizing that it's scary for people to go through this process, right? They, they've never retired before. They've never lost a spouse before. They've never been in the same position. And the, the value that the advisor can bring is saying, we've seen this hundreds of times, right? We know what works in this scenario. We know how to talk to you about it. We know what things to look at and, and specifically which questions to ask. Because the clients typically don't know which questions are the most important. So almost highlighting and shining a light on the problem areas and saying, well, have you noticed this? And, and like, do you know that this could be a potential issue? And sometimes they say, oh, yeah, we're completely aware of it and we choose to ignore it. Um, and then you just obviously need to sh showcase them or explain to them what the impact is of that. But oftentimes it's just that, like you say, it's that, uh, that last step and that last commitment. We saw that with the robo-advice platform because we thought – it would be younger clients with 500 grand debit orders. And actually, it was clients that had a really bad experience with another financial advisor that have accumulated large amounts of money. And why it didn't work out well is that they didn't have the confidence or the courage to actually implement something. So we saw a great opportunity for clients coming through that portal to have discussions on a financial planning basis. And almost then taking the the robo-advisor and, and hiding it on the back end just to make sure that your business runs more efficiently and that your relationships can be a lot more powerful. And that's seemed to be a good balance for us. Well, yeah, no, that's, well, I, I think we can talk another three hours just about that, if not the whole day. Um, tell me, Luis, so, I mean, what hasn't worked? Uh, some of the things that you've tried, which, which ones, was there some things that didn't work in terms of charging fees? I'm trying to think back now. I think we, the most of the time, it's just where we're stuck in our own heads, right? Thinking, or obviously, the one is not charging enough, right? So we commit to, to an amount and we do all this work, and the client says, Oh, okay, great. Thank you. This was a bargain. Um, we, <laughs> yeah. we just wait for the time, but you end up spending all of your time and energy on that, and it, and it isn't necessarily financially rewarding. So I would say the thing that didn't work is the actual. RAN component. So find out how much it costs you to service your client, right? So if you look at all of your expenses in your business, your accounting software would be able to tell you, divide that between the number of clients. And it's a crude measure, but it gives you a sense of how much it costs you to service one client. You can't be charging less than that, right? Otherwise, you're diluting um, that amount. So we definitely don't charge enough and it's still a thing and it, it's still thinking, oh, is, is the... Is the client going to see the value in this? Um, but it's it's always our kind of our own uh, our own biases coming to play. Um, if the client's committed and the client's ready, they're not always ready to pay for advice. Often it comes up saying, "But I can get this advice for free somewhere else." And we challenge that, and we say, "Well, just because it's free, 
but you're not maybe paying in some other form, right? So having that discussion around it, um, a client education component, we've seen clients in the old days, we were only charged on the product side, they go and implement products themselves. Um, so yeah, I would say the biggest one is just not charging enough, uh, giving away things for free uh, that should be paid for. And I believe you should be giving a lot of things away for free, but there's still stuff that clients need to pay for. And that that is the real yeah. impact. Definitely. Cool. Okay. So now, I mean, we, we've been alluding like to technology, technology, even mentioned an accounting system now and all of that. So obviously, it's, when I get into that conversation, uh, to sort of ask you, I know that you you love and that you embrace technology uh, in your business. I mean, that's where this whole thing started, basically, was putting together a robo-advisor. So obviously, there's an, there's an affinity, and I'm making an assumption here, um, you know, uh, but if we look at the technology that you employ today, uh, which one of those, or, or you know, which ones can't you do without at the moment? Which which ones is really critical and um, you know instrumental to your business? Um, I've thought about this for quite a while, and I think we can we can go through the ones that we use. But there's this problem that we're always looking for the best tool, right? and I really believe there isn't such a thing as the best tool. It's just what is the most applicable. And what's going to work for you, right? So finding something that you may be using more features of and just, I guess, picking anything and just <laughs> learning how to use it. So in, in our business, the one that we use a lot is 1Password. So it just allows us to share passwords between, uh, between the team and hide them and create unique passwords for each login site. Uh, but there's many alternatives to that. On the accounting side, we use Zero. Once again, many alternatives, but it just allows the time to be spent on accounting to just <laughs> shrink down um, and you have access to view the information uh, when you need to. So whenever we look at a tool, we say, well, is this telling me a story? Right? And, and you had your hand and on Tuesday. And what Comspace allows us to do is it allows us to tell a story about the revenue side of our business, like how are we generating an income? Because your accounting software just tells you, here's your income and here's your expenses. It doesn't, it tells you a story about where your money is going and what's left, but it doesn't tell you how you generated that income. So Comspace is on the list. Um, personally, I used Todoist, just a, a task tracking, but once again, you need to pick your own favorite one and kind of figure out what, what works for you. Um, we, one thing we do very differently is that we don't use the traditional uh, financial planning software in South Africa. We've taken quite a different ap approach. Um, we use HubSpot as our CRM, and that just allows us to track communication with clients in different fields. And, and the beauty is that, that you don't even have to pay for it. So we're getting into a world where software is for free, right? For most of these things. And, and if you do pay, it's a minimal fee compared to what it would cost you to spend the time and build that yourself. Right? So I think that is important just to know that the world is moving quite quickly and we can use global software. We don't have to be constrained to the South African market. Um, maybe we should, should we touch on the financial planning software? Yeah, and sure. Let's, let's talk about what are you using for financial planning? Because this is all running your business and this is all critical. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, you know, most of these things, or all of them actually, uh, to do is I don't know. I know of it, but I don't know it personally. Uh, one password I use LastPass, uh, for example. There, uh, Zero and Sage, uh, those are, are the two main ones. And then Comspace, obviously. Um, and then HubSpot. I've been talking about HubSpot. Um, you know, I've also tried HubSpot. It's a fantastic tool because you can literally track all the all the different things in in there. So, so let's touch on on what are you using for the financial planning side of of things. So we've gone around in circles trying to find great financial planning software. And I think the one that really resonated with us was Asset Map. And it's about a year and a half ago, um, a local team called Work That Matters brought Asset Map. So Asset Map is a US-based software, and they acquired the license to help local financial planners use Asset Map. And when you look at Asset Map, you think, oh, this doesn't have this function. It doesn't have that function. It doesn't have that function. And, and one thing that Johan from Comspace taught me is that 
not having a function is a function, right? So the fact that you are limited in what you can do brings amount brings about an amount of focus to focus on the important things. So what Asset Map does, it does exactly the same as your HP 10B and a piece of paper. So it allows you to put in um, your financial information of where you are into a visual mind map. And clients love that. Right? So we're creating a map with the client. It's not I'm planning and here's your, here's your plan, Francho. Right? It's, it's an experience. Right? So think about the, the builder bears. You can build, you can buy a teddy bear for, I don't know, 50 rand that we can pay. Or you can go to build a bear and you can build your own bear and you can get the stuffing and you can get the heart. And, and that experience, people are willing to pay a premium for. Um, it's scary at the beginning. So showing a client what software you use and, and them asking questions that you might not be able to answer. But just like anything, if a client asks you a question and you don't know, just say, hey, I don't know. I'll find out and I'll come back to you. And if it's really not that important, maybe just kind of explain to them that you'll touch on it a little bit later. So when we started using Asset Map, it really had to get us back to the core of financial planning, saying if we had no financial products, how would clients still be willing to pay for this experience? So the experience of organizing your finances the experience of bringing clarity around what you have and why you have it. And most people have never seen their finances on one paper, right? One piece of paper just saying, here's your life. Here's your financial life. So just the reflection process of a client seeing what they've accumulated um, is already really powerful. Uh, most of the clients coming in has got a concern and that concern is, am I going to be okay? Right? So I think that's the number one question. So this asset map is allowed and you, you can really use a piece of paper and you can use whatever you want. It's just forced us into this process of reflecting on where the client is at and then allowing to slot goals into that, right? So they call it target maps. So creating a financial rand or dollar or euro amount that you're aiming towards and showing the client how much on track are they. So are they 100% on track? Are they 50%? Are they 110% on track? And then you can start having a discussion around how important those goals are. Kind of how are they going to be funded? And you start looking at, we call these things levers, right? So all these different levers that you can pull and push to make sure that they get to their financial goal. One of them is returns and one other one is fees and timelines. And so the dilemma with most of the planning software is like, well, if I want to change the retirement date by one year, I have to go back and do a lot of work. And sorry, Mr. Client, we'll see you at the next meeting. Where this has just allowed us to create that financial planning experience. Um, and so far, I mean, we've loved it and clients have loved it. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Kirsty from uh, Work That Matters uh, and on episode 10 of Propulsion, where we intensely spoke about, about Asset Map. And uh, I've put it on the screen. If you want to go listen to that podcast, you want to learn more about Asset Map, you can go do it there. And uh, I see this podcast has even made it to the States. They, they posted on LinkedIn the other day that Asset Map have shared this uh, them, themselves. So really making the rounds. But uh, if you want to learn more about what it's about and, and what it can do and how you can contact them, uh, you can you can do it there. Uh, and do let them know that you're coming from this show and from us uh, so that they can know that we that we talk about them when we do. It wasn't planned to talk about them. It's just like sometimes these things come up and, and you know. Um, so I want to jump a little bit ahead to, to automation. Uh, we've spoken about automation or employing technology in another episode. And I just want to sort of, I mean, what have you automated in your business and what are you using to to implement this automation you know, and just maybe a, a quick overview of that, Louis, is just because I think there's a lot of things that we do repetitively and over and over and over again, and we can really use technology to be able to help us get rid of a lot of this repetitiveness in, in our business and also then eliminate a lot of mistakes that, that happens when, when people are doing those. So, um, you know, have you automated? And, and if so, what are you using to, to implement this automation? That's a great question. Um, I think... It's easy to fall into the or I certainly have fallen into the trap to say, we want to automate everything, right? So we just want to be completely hands off and the client must go through the whole experience. Um, so we've intentionally automated the things that maybe the client um, 
maybe it's not important to the client. Maybe it takes up a lot of our time. Maybe it's just not fun filling out this form and getting this form to be signed. So um, we've started using something called Quickly Sign. It's a local um, provider that allows people to sign electronically. Um, it's really affordable. And that's allowed us to automate the kind of signing process where a client can sign once and it populates to all the signed fields that they require. It sends them a copy of the contract. It sends them an audit log. And from a compliance perspective, uh, everyone's happy with, with that. So I think that's one of the, the automations that work quite well. The other one is using something called Text Expander. And it allows you to almost write a, a little bit of a template, right? So if you find yourself writing the same thing over and over again, but you have a little field that you have to insert, Text Expander allows you to automate that process. Um, the other one that comes to mind is something called Zapier, and it allows you to connect different applications. So if you've got information in the one application, you want to send it to the other one, Zapier allows you to add a specific time or specific trigger, push that information to the other system. Now, a lot of the bigger American or global businesses does allow this. Very few of the local providers um, are on the, on the platform to be sending information around. And, if you think about a kind of a Lego block, right, approach, just to saying, well, instead of finding the one system that works really well and does everything well, we've gone the approach to have little building blocks and just having the information being sent between them uh, so that you don't have to capture all these things again. Um, but the problem with automation is that you can forget about it. And obviously, if it fails, uh, you, need, you still need to keep an eye on it. Um, and I almost want to say that automation is becoming less important because a lot of the tasks are almost handed, not handed back to the client, but we're including them in the experience. So we're giving them things to do. We're saying, well, you can capture some of your information here. I'm going to fill out this. Uh, and that's brought into the map and it's brought into the financial planning process. So always think with that kind of what is the client experience and do they need their hands to be held during that process? Uh, if not, try and automate it. Yeah, and um, you know, things like Zapier is quite cool. I'm, I'm also using Zapier for some of the things that I do. And and if some of the things fail, they do send you luckily an email to say, listen, these things did not complete. So there are luckily some fail saves there. Uh, and it is what you're saying. You know, I think it's, again, maybe this 80-20 principle, which is, the, you know, 20% of the things that we should automate that's going to save us 80% of the time and not mm -hmm. try and automate every single thing. Uh, so if you combine automation and client experience, I think that's what I'm hearing, you know, that can be very powerful. Um, and how are you finding, are, are people willing to go and enter information that you ask them to do? Are they quite happy to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you framed it correctly and you've explained to them what this process is going to be and they know that it's secure and it's a safe process, um, clients want to have some sense of control and we always tell them it's your money, right? It's not our money. You need to be taking responsibility. We're going to be giving you responsibility in this financial planning process. Yes, we'll still give you the best possible advice that we can, but we can't be responsible for your financial habits and the way you look at your money. And what we try and do is almost reframe how they see their money, right? which usually that cause of anxiety to say, actually, I'm comfortable about it. I can talk about it to my spouse. I know where I'm heading. And I know why I've got these things in place. And that's, I mean, it's such a more powerful relationship uh, that you can build. Yeah. Today's advice, um, if you look at the way that different people are giving advice, and I think even how financial planners and advisors are defining advice and what it means to them and what they really do and focus on, um, and, and each onto his own. I mean, you decide on a business model, so it, it's nothing, I don't think there's this, you know, there's like, there's this holy grail with this, this is the way, if you do it any other way, then, you know, you're filled with sin and you shouldn't even be in the industry or any, I don't believe in that. Um, but what I, what I am picking up and, and it's something you've, you've mentioned, uh, you know, sort of as well to me before is that if you, if you look at the kind of advice that people are getting today, um, you know, why does it feel like, you know, sometimes it's to go like, it's, it's the same old, same old and almost that you're getting financial indigestion <laughs> kind of, you know, feeling. Um, why do you think that is, uh, you know, is it the case? I mean, is it even true what I'm, what I'm saying? You know, do, do you feel the same and, and what is your view? 
Mm, I think it's I think it's spot on because advice can be this massive thing, right? So if you go through the six step financial planning process, you have to show someone all of their faults and you have to find a solution for all of the all of the problems. And I think medicine and medical doctors had the same issue, right? So it's that compliance rate. So how much of that advice that you're giving is actually being implemented? And they said that people that that had a heart disease, only 20% of them kind of drink constantly their medication and make sure they go for their regular checkup. So uh, what is that for what is that figure for financial planning? I think we have this massive amount of knowledge and almost scare people and as an industry it's very easy to do um scare people into doing the right thing and i think that's a terrible approach just mentally your brain switches off and you go into this kind of defense mode and if we had to do that differently i would almost say what piece of this can we break off and focus on for now that's going to have a really big impact and get you on that momentum to get your financial planning in order. Well, you're not gonna go from everything's in disarray to, hey, I've got the perfect plan. And then once you have the perfect plan, if it's not implemented, what's the point? All right, so I think just breaking it down into smaller pieces, those Lego blocks that the client can say, great, I can understand why this is important. Um, I'm ready to implement it. I know what I need to do and I'm motivated to do it. And you're going to hold me accountable in our next discussion for the things that we've implemented. Um, it's the same outcome, but it's a completely different experience. Yeah. So it's not so much the advice that's causing the indigestion. It is more the overload, like the amount of things we want to do all in one go instead of making this a journey and breaking it down and making it just easier and more digestible fault lines. That is that is more, more the thing. So what is next for financial planning, do you think, uh, Louis? Where are we headed? What are the things we should be thinking about uh, what's what's next? I think the things that are very topical at the moment, and you see a lot of advisors talking about it, is the coaching side of things. Um, even if you listen to the guys like Carl Richards uh, saying that if he had to go back to university, he'd probably have an element of positive psychology or counseling. So I think very much bringing that into the norm of financial planning and creating a great financial planning experience where clients are involved, involved in the process. The other big one is almost moving from a, a formal annual or biannual or quarterly review to constant interactions, right? So that you become the mentor and the leader and the guide for your clients. And the nice analogy that I, that I think of is kind of the, the Sherpa is taking people up Mount Everest. The difficult part's not going up Mount Everest. The place where most people fail and most people pass away is climbing down, right? So guiding people through that process when they're in a difficult part of their lives, where there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So in retirement, when they're selling a business, when they're getting an inheritance, those life transitions, I think that we're definitely going to see more of. I think the technology is, is going to become kind of almost hidden. So the client experience technology, but it's not in their face. It's not scary and it's not, uh, I have this anxiety when I have to deal with a financial plan. And you can think of you know, the things they're doing with virtual reality, allowing someone to experience their, their retirement based on where they are now. So I think it's, it's really exciting to be part of this journey. And if we think about the situation that we are now, other than the medical profession, we probably have the biggest role to play in our clients' lives now, keeping them calm, talking through the potential action points, what they need to do, and just that safety net of, of supporting them um, when times are really tough. Yeah, I love it. All righty. So um, I want to jump into uh, some questions here or some comments. I don't know what to expect. I haven't looked at them yet. So let me just go, let's go up here and see where we greeted everybody um what is going on good morning good morning good morning russell uh i can fully relate to louis experience as a young financial advisor yeah um i mean you are two of the guys that i like i'm watching the most <laughs> about what you're doing and and sort of the things that you're talking about because both you and russell are really you know you're forward thinking you're really serious about what you do you're really committed to what you're doing and and uh, yeah so i just want to commend both of you uh for for that so it's great to to hear from russell as well Kevin, 
is saying when there are uh, when three are walking together, I'm sure to find teachers among them. I will select their good qualities and follow them, their bad qualities, and avoid them. Confucius. Yes, thank you for that, Kevin. That's awesome. Um, Louis, how much would you pay a fresh graduate as trainee advisor? So I think at the moment, we're very much equated to the auditing firm. So getting that three-year process so that they can get their um, CFP designation. So I would say anywhere between 10 and 15,000 Rand. It, it sounds quite low, but I think that's, that increase is quite steep. Um, also depends on the skill set and what they bring to the table. So I think that's a good benchmark. Yes. Um, Mark says, yeah, it's very lonely, uh, you know, in general anyway, uh, but now during lockdown even more so. Uh, so he's just saying that the live shows are really helping to keep up his spirits. I'm very happy to hear that, Mark. Uh, great stuff. Uh, Craig Eberson is saying it's a great session. Uh, Denise says, amazing session. Thank you. Best wishes, Louis, for your birthday tomorrow, she says. So let me put it on the screen here. There's Denise. She's saying happy birthday to you for tomorrow. Um, Kuketsu says, uh, really enjoy your perspective on things. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Let me hop on over here to my friends on LinkedIn and see what's been going on here. Um, Amanda John says, uh, good morning, Amanda. It takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Keep going. Yes. Um, let's see. Rob Jones said, very valuable. Um, and then we've got Naveen from Mauritius. Naveen, welcome here. Yeah? First time I've seen you here. Johan Forster says, I'm all, like in big capital letters, all for paying for advice because then I'm getting advice and not just product selling. So he's very positive about that. Gerber Stein is saying, a mentorship, partnerships, and succession are all key to sustainability and no matter your tenure in our profession. Yes, that is very true. Uh, Lona says, uh, I love HubSpot. It's a great CRM tool. I must say, me too. And it's got a, 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 a sort of a, a CRM side and actually a marketing side to it. So, so they've, they've got these different tools and systems and things that you can use. Uh, so that's awesome. Yvonne uh, says, uh, Asset Map is awesome for this purpose. We use it with a fully integrated financial model that helps to guide the future visual impact with different planning outcomes so that they can make informed decisions. It talks to our wealth integrated tool. That's an old mutual tool for those of you that don't know. Um, and it is something that uh, Tian also mentioned on a previous episode uh, about that and, uh, and so forth. And if you look on LinkedIn, they've shared a video, actually a two-minute video that explains uh, all of that as well. Um, Johan says one of the best parts of Asset Map for an advisor is the SA team behind it, amazing people. Um, Neil Phillips says he went for a cycle, but he'll watch the recording later. It's a great show. Thank you very much. Um, Razan says, great client experience and mindset insights. Uh, also, I mean, I also want to highlight that, Louis, where you've really mentioned client experience quite a number of times, and we've also spoken about it a couple of times on the show. And it's something I want to delve in more uh, into more in the future in the show, because that's what it's about. It's how we make people feel. And if they walk out of there, say, wow, that was different. That was amazing. But not only that, well, oh, this is really helping me change my life and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's also the results and the outcomes and the impact it has mm -hmm. over and above how it makes you feel. And, I mean, those things just add on to the feeling of, of how one would feel. Um, so, I mean, how long has it been that you've been focused? Have you always been focusing on client experience or is it something that you started focusing on a lot recently? I think from a business experience and kind of enjoying – uh, reading business books, it's always been important, but I, I've never really known how to implement it in the business until we started asking clients, how do you feel about your money? Right? So yeah. we write that down and then we try and track that over time. We say, well, how are you feeling now? Like, how are you feeling after our session? Uh, how are you feeling after six months? How are you feeling after a year? And the response has been amazing. And it's not always like the technical stuff. It's that I get to sleep at night. I get to have conversations about my money. I don't feel guilty for having money or for not having money. Um, and I think the clients might have always have had a great experience. But if you never help them to reflect on it, they don't realize it. Right? Mm -hmm. So getting that own insight. And I read something yesterday where someone was talking about active questions versus passive questions. Passive questions being uh, how did it go and what happened? And, Active being, how did you contribute to get to your goals and how are you moving forward? Kind of getting that client into just reflecting on their experience and then saying, okay, what went well? What didn't go well? What can we improve? improve? And that's that 1% that every day. Uh, and sometimes you'll go backwards, right? And you'll say, okay, that wasn't the right one. Move that forward. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I think just yeah. asking asking the right questions is probably probably key. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, just a quick thing that um, tomorrow. Just remember, we've got Ross Bernstein, guys. This is huge for us. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic way to to celebrate our fiftieth uh, episode. Uh, so I just want to remind you, it'll be three p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so on Friday afternoon, three p.m. Uh, we did send out emails where you could download a calendar uh, thingy to to put it into your to calendar. If not, please put it in there. Uh, this is this is going to be great. You're really going to enjoy this, uh, particularly if you love sports. But even if you don't, it doesn't matter. You're still going to love it. So just as a reminder that we've got Ross on tomorrow afternoon to uh, celebrate with us our 50th episode. Louis, you could just as well be in my 50th episode. <laughs> this was absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, judging from all the other comments that I haven't even read, you can go and look at them on LinkedIn afterwards. Um, but uh, got, people have really gotten a lot of value from you today. So thank you very much from, from me and from everybody. Um, yeah, I will see you uh, then soon and we'll chat. And thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Thanks, Mantra. Keep well, eh?